after seeing the same questions again and again, here are 10 things you should know about immigration in New Zealand right now. It is 9am here on Thursday 14th of July 2022. My name is Aaron Hunt, I am the partner here at the law firm State Hammond where I have the immigration team. As always this is not legal advice, this is just our commentary on immigration here in New Zealand. If you're looking for assistance with your immigration please get in contact with us uh, through our website or at the email in the address down below. Question number one, what until advice? Now, often an immigration officer will be seeking some sort of advice from somebody else within Immigration New Zealand. Now, they're not going to tell you as to who they are asking and what question they are asking of them, but and as of a couple of months ago, they will no longer even tell you when they made that request. Now, this is all information that you personally should have access to um, under the Privacy Act, but they're not going to make it easy for you to get this, uh, requiring you to put an application in which takes 20 working days to get processed. Now, immigration has taken this approach to sort of keep this stuff secret from you. Uh, we don't see the reason why, but it's definitely something which um, makes it more difficult to you and definitely creates more anxiety. Question number two, national security checks. Now, these are checks that are required by the NZSIS and are actually done by the NZSIS. If you've been asked to provide uh, your tertiary education history or you know, your previous jobs going back as far as you can recall, then most likely your application is having to go through a national security check or an NSC. Now, who needs to go through an NSC is in itself its secret. Um, and Immigration New Zealand and the NZSIS will not provide a list to us or anybody else as to what triggers the need for an NSC. Uh, we can tell you, however, from our experience, um, some of the requirements that are going through there. And we tell you this is from our experience, not from actually seeing that list. And it's those of you who come from uh, Nigeria, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Iran, China, and Zimbabwe can all expect to have to go through this. But along also those of you who may come from other countries or uh, have citizenship from other countries or have some other trigger which requires NSC requirement. Now, what it does mean is your application will take longer to process, perhaps up to six months longer, which is how long immigration give uh, the NZSIS to provide the response to a national security check. Um, and it all just basically comes down to what country you're from or perhaps what passport you hold. Question number three. RB21, where is my application up to? Now the new system does provide with uh, more information than the old one did as to where your application is up to, but just barely. Uh, it gives you one of uh, several set statuses. There's sort of four it's going to possibly be sitting in for most of you, and that's about it. We had a new system here that had an op option to provide you with a lot more information, a lot more visibility of what's going on in the background, and they chose not to do that, instead requiring you to call up immigration, sit in queue possibly for an hour or two, to ask uh, a simple update of where things are up to and what's going on. Now, this wouldn't be an issue if the system was functioning as it was meant to or intended to, but as you'll see in the following questions, that really isn't what is taking place. Now, if your application is being handled by a, a lawyer or, or a, uh, a advisor, then you can ask them to share their application with you by providing them with a sharing code that you'll be able to see if you'd log into the new system. Now, we have heard of some refusing to do that, but we would suggest that you complain to them and say, hey, that's my information, that's my application, you have to share it with me. Um, and I think they'd be hard pushed to give a reason as to why they shouldn't. I know that all of our clients on request will get the application shared with them because, well, it's their application. Question number four, RV21, how long does it take? We see so many people asking this question about uh, how long it's taking or complaining that they've been sitting at a certain stage for a certain period of time and asking as to why it hasn't moved forward. Now, some delays are caused by the issues that we are seeing on this list and we're going to come to more of those in a few questions time. However, the biggest delay is just down to the number of applications that have been made and that there aren't enough Immigration New Zealand staff working on these applications. Now, there is uh, 80,000 applications that have been made under Phase 2, which is probably the greatest of applications ever submitted within a, a very short period ever handled by immigration. And these are all residence applications which do require some level of more uh, care than you would see with other uh, temporary applications. However, Immigration New Zealand could be more honest and open about numbers at each stage to give you an idea as to where things are up to, uh, instead of just basically leaving migrants sitting there anxious and not knowing 
as to why it's been sitting there for, for several months without moving. It is hard to see where the things are going as a whole as the information just isn't there. So what we're going to do is give you an update based on the applications that we have submitted, which is a, probably enough applications for our clients to get an idea as to where most applications as a whole, as a number, are sitting within the system. Now, looking, now we have seen a lot of movement in the last few days. We've seen a lot of applications moving forward to, to uh, new stages, which is fantastic. It seems to happen every sort of six to eight weeks, we'll see a big movement en masse. And it's happened in the last few days, and even as of this morning, we saw some movements taking place. Now, for our applications, and for what we're seeing online, about 7% of the applications in Phase 2 have been granted. And 15% are sitting at the under-assessment stage, which is that final stage before a decision is made. Uh, but it can sit at that stage for up to sort of six, seven, eight weeks at times. Others might go through quickly, but some will take longer for whatever reason because, you know, it isn't that visible. 45% of applications are sitting at the gathering information stage, which is a very unhelpful uh, name for that stage because actually information is gathered um, at three of the four stages. Uh, so we're not quite sure as to why they decided that would be the gathering information stage when, frankly, information comes at all points. And we have about a third, 33% sitting at the preparing application stage, which is that very first stage that you would have got to um, after you submitted your documentation. Now often these delays are down to the fact that there just are not enough officers working on these applications to allow things to push ahead. But there is some other delays that are taking place which we are going to cover. Um, as always though, don't try to compare your application to those of your friends or what you see online as each application is different. Uh, if you are sitting in that preparing application stage, that early stage, remember that you are sort of one in three applicants are sitting in that stage now. And 45%, so you know, four and a half out of ten applicants are sitting at the next stage, that gathering information. There's only been a small number so far, 7% have got granted, 15% sitting in that uh, under assessment stage. So it is a very slow process and we are only several months into what is, a, what is typically with residence applications, a slow application typically taking sort of six to twelve months. So we are sort of four months in, so just give it time. Question number five, when is the skilled migrant category coming back? Now, despite it having no impact on the border whatsoever, there is no news on when the skilled migrant draws will restart. Now, these were stopped in March 2020, uh, and of course, because they were primarily used by those who were uh, who are onshore, um, we're not quite sure as to why they were paused in the first place because it created no risk for those coming from offshore. The last word the previous minister, um, the Honourable Chris Farfoy, gave on the return of SMC draws. Uh, was given late last year in a question in Parliament when he said that they would return in late 2022 or early 2023. However, with the release of the Greenlist residence applications uh, coming this September, that may mean that the SMC draws may be pushed back further uh, as the, the new minister may be able to say, well, we've given a new pathway to residence through the Greenlist residency. Uh, we're not going to bring back SMC until there is processing room for them to be done. Uh, and with the RB21s, uh, that's going to possibly be uh, some time away. Question number six, what about the Greenlist residence? There's lots been said about the green list residents coming up in September, but actually with very little detail. We've basically just had um, information from the Minister uh, in Immigration New Zealand that this is coming in September. Now, some will be able to apply straight away if they are on Tier 1 in the green list, um, but it isn't clear if they need to be on an accredited employer work visa at that point, or if they can apply off another work visa type. Now, for those in Tier 2, uh, they'll need two years before they can apply, but it isn't certain as whether that means two years from September or two years in that job starting at any point in the past, or whether it's two years on an AEWV, Accredited Employer Work Visa visa. Um, there is no sort of clarification as to what any of that means. Uh, right now we just know that there is a new residence coming, but how it's going to work and the criteria for it just hasn't been released and won't probably be released until September when we see the um, amendment circular change in the operational manual. Uh, we will cover that when it does take place, but until then, nobody really knows. Question number seven, have they backtracked the December partner changes? Well, no, at least not yet. So from December, the government has announced that the 
that most partners of work visa holders will not be eligible for an open work visa as they currently would get now um, unless the main applicant was uh, working in a green list role although it's not clear whether they have to be on in a green list role under an AUWV visa or an essential skills visa or how that's going to work it is just not clear however there has been words going around yesterday that the government has backtracked on this um, on this change coming December um, but it hasn't done that, and I think that's been a misinterpretation of what the government has um, just put out in a recent change to the operational manual. As it currently stands, from December, most partners of workers and students will not be eligible for an open work visa anymore. So if you, uh, if you are the partner of a worker or a student and um, your partner has a work visa that goes further in the future than yours currently does, uh, you may want to look at applying prior to December to, uh, to secure, to see whether you, whether you can secure an open work visa uh, with your partner because from December you may lose that right and you'll basically be locked down to just applying for a uh, partnership visitor visa uh, or a new variation of that to stay in the country but just as a visitor without being able to work unless you apply for a work visa yourself under the AEWV scheme. We will come back with more information about that when it is released but right now uh, there is nothing to indicate that it has been backtracked and that change is still set to go ahead. Question number eight. Offshore partners but not dependents. Now we have seen that on the 4th of July there was a uh, reasonably quiet allowance uh, given that partners, uh, offshore partners for workers who are onshore were able to, to now apply for a uh, work visa or a partnership visa to come into the country and be with their partner. For some reason though, dependents of onshore workers can't apply until 1st of August. Um, honestly, we don't know why they decided that partners can apply now, but their children can't apply until, you know, later or the end of this month or start of next month. Uh, that hasn't been clarified as to why. Uh, we can't, we'd be guessing. But that is how the law currently stands. Question number nine of the IB21, why are they asking for a new medical? Now we see this a lot, it's probably one of the biggest frustrations we have with the current system and there's a lot of things with the new system which we find extremely frustration, frustrating. Uh, there's probably another sort of 10 things in this list we could put in there as to errors with how this new system is doing things. This one, one is probably one of the ones we see the, as the biggest issue. Uh, and probably about 20% of our clients have been asked to provide a new medical uh, either themselves or their partner or, their, or one of their children uh, when the current medical is still valid as at the time of the application. Now we've had clients who have had medicals that were close to expiring when the application was made but they were still valid within that three year allowance. Others who have had medicals done with applications last year, the year before, even medicals done in the past few months before the application was submitted, all of which were valid. I think out of all of our clients who were asked to provide a new medical, only one actually needed to provide a medical and they were aware of that and already had it booked in to be done. The rest had no requirement to provide a new medical, yet the new system asked them to go and do so. Now the issue we have here is that this is or will be seen by an applicant who will go, oh my goodness, I need a new medical and will go and get one done at their cost when it's not required. Now looking at 20% of our of our clients who have been asked this, if you put, map, copy that across to the entire 80,000 applications, 20%, 20,000, now imagine 20,000 applications all going and getting unneeded medicals that's about $8 million plus in unnecessary costs being spent by migrants for things which weren't required. Now, we raised this fault with the system with immigration probably back in early April when they first started sending out these requests. Um, and immigration at the time looked into it and admitted that there was a fault there in how the old and new systems communicate. The new one goes to the old one, is a medical required? The old one communicates back yes or no. For whatever reason, that communication is not working right, and here we are, 14 July, months later, still not working right, and immigration is aware of this issue. Now, we've asked them to put out a, um, a release to migrants to say, hey, be cautious about this, um, we know this is an issue, and it's impacting a lot of applications, don't do this. They have not yet made this public, they have not put it out there, they have not put out a release, a note on the system, anything whatsoever, they just rely on migrants to, to know, I suppose, the rules and to, to question immigration. Now, we see an issue with this because if immigration says to you, hey, you need to do this, migrants should be able to trust that immigration is on are correct 
with that request. Here, they are not. Now, the response from the ICC, the, the call centre, is to upload a cover letter to the application saying this is not required um, and don't go and get the new medical. If you do go get the new medical based on this, the call centre says to file a complaint uh, and perhaps request a refund of that cost for your medical. But for many of you, you won't want to um, see, be seen complaint immigration about immigration and them making a fault. So we're going to keep pushing immigration to make this public and for Pete's sake to please fix this issue you've known about for months which is costing migrants money. Uh, until then, if you know you don't require a medical, uh, then put a cover letter on there and just state that that's what immigration have been saying that people should be doing. If you aren't certain whether you require a medical or not, uh, seek legal advice or call the call centre and ask them to check. The call centre can check the system and will be able to tell you about whether yes or no a medical is actually required. Question number 10, but I already provided uh, our passports to the VAC. Now this comes down to the new system asking for people to provide their passport to the VAC for those who are offshore. Now in a number of situations that passport would have been provided with a previous application um, and the VAC would have already had it, scanned it to immigration and confirmed that it was genuine. We're seeing this happening with a number of our applicants who are being asked to provide it anyway, even though it's already been provided. If that is you and you've provided it previously, definitely you can confirm with it, the um, ICC, with the call centre, they can confirm whether the immigration do actually require it or not. If the VSC has already had that particular passport, then you should be required to provide it again and, of course, incur the cost in doing so. Uh, we have also had one applicant who had never been outside New Zealand or to asked to provide it on the basis that immigration thought they were offshore. So definitely look out for that as well. If you are onshore, you shouldn't be getting asked to provide your passport with this new, um, this new application. But if it does say uh, you are offshore and you're actually onshore, then definitely also raise that as well. Now, as with the medical issue, they are asking people to put a cover letter on their application. But with this, they seem to have gone a step further. They have asked the call centre to escalate these issues uh, when they are seen. So if you have been asked to provide a VAC, uh, passport to the VAC and it's already been provided previously, uh, call up the call centre, put on a cover letter, get the call centre to check to make sure you aren't, um, that you aren't actually you know, required to provide it. Perhaps you've got a new passport, that will be required. Uh, and if, you, if they do say to you, no, it's not required, ask them to escalate it. They've been asked to escalate these ones to get them fixed and to move the application forward. Um, this seems to be perhaps creating more of a delay or a drag on applications going forward. So by escalating it, they can hopefully uh, you know, tick that box, trigger the process to get your application moving through the stages. And that is it for today's video. That's the sort of 10 things we wanted to make aware, you aware of, uh, issues that are going on with immigration here in New Zealand right now with these applications. There are a lot more. There's failures with the new work visa system. There's failures with how things are worded that aren't clear. There is just a lot of issues everywhere right now, but these were ones we thought perhaps were going to be the most pertinent to you. Um, and of course, that's not ignoring you who of those who are stuck offshore without a visa. Uh, we are still working on that with many others trying to get some sort of solution for you. Um, but as for all of you, we are seeing the struggles you are going through with the new systems, with these, the processing, with the, uh, the lack of clarity and visibility that immigration are providing to you, uh, and with the number of errors which immigration just won't even admit that even there. Um, and we do feel for you because it's something that we are dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, and we will come back to you when we hear anything more and hopefully we can get immigration to start being a bit more vocal uh, when there are these issues and provide you with uh, some more clarity of how you are to go about it. Until then, kia kaha and stay safe.